Are we live? Or are we recording? Hi everybody! Hi friends! How are you? If you're new to my channel, welcome! And if you're a returnee, welcome again! My name is Christian Friends. I will take you to my work tonight! Given that I am a night shift nurse in my unit, which is a cardiothoracic surgery step-down unit. It's a mouthful. In short, cardiac floor. My goal is to walk you through what usually happens in a night. And when I say usually, I mean like usually, ideally, because <laughs> for those who work in the hospital, you know there's not an ideal night. So many things happen, different things happen every single shift. And there's not much really I can show you on the floor itself given HIPAA, <laughs> which is meant to protect patients' information. Anyways, I'll try to make this night a teaching night, bits and pieces of what I've learned in the unit and what we usually go through. And hopefully we can also get other people to chime in. Until I'll take you and enjoy with me. <laughs> Just arrived here at the hospital in our unit. I'm in the locker room now. I'm going to put away my stuff and before I do that, I will show you what I usually bring to my ship. First, I usually of course have my pen, Muji pens only. I love my gel pens. A marker to write on the whiteboards, my pen light. Working. <laughs> when I do my neuro exam and if it's too dark in the room, let's say late at night and the lights are off and I need to check the level of their chest tubes or whatnot. Light light. Scissor. If I need to cut any tape or heparin IV bags, which I can never open. And the most important part, my stethoscope. Of course it's a cardiac floor. We listen to the heart and lungs of patients as they do everywhere in any floor. But it's very important on our floor. You'll be surprised how many things you can predict or can find just by listening to the heart or the lung sounds alone. For example, even if I don't know a patient's diagnosis, if I hear let's say a murmur on their chest, which is this like turbulent quick swishing sound of the heart, I'm thinking Oh, this patient probably has stenosis of one of the valves, which is a narrowing. So if one of the valves of the heart are narrowed, it has to work more to pump blood, which is what causes the turbulent blood flow. Or for those after surgery, which they have chest tubes or wires, epicardial wires in their heart, and when they're pulled out, it's possible that someone gets a cardiac tamponade, which is when all the blood in the heart gushes out and it fills their surrounding sac of the heart, and you'll hear distant heart sounds when you use your stethoscope, so very important. So it is quite a bit early, shift doesn't start until 7 o'clock, but I do tend to go out this time to the nursing station just to say hi to everybody and if the assignment's ready, I'll read up on my patients and then when 7 comes, we get a handoff from the day shift nurses. And so mixing whatever read prior from the notes and the updates from the day nurses, I generally have a whole picture of what to expect about my patient and what to plan for and to do for the rest of the night. And that's that. <laughs> So it's 7 o'clock, I finally got a report on all of my assigned patients. The first thing I do is of course introduce myself to my patients. I actually also do my physical assessments right off the bat when I enter the room from head to toe. One of the most important things as I start my shift is knowing all of my patients baseline. Baselines in their vital signs, their mentation, their physical body, their indwelling lines whether it's an IV, a central line, a chest tube, or the Foley output. By knowing my baselines, I can assess if something changes throughout the shift so that we can reassess and monitor and hopefully treat it right away. I was assigned 5 patients tonight, but let's focus on the 3 with the cases that we usually see on the floor. First up is a post-open heart surgery patient, a 53-year-old male who had cabbage surgery 4 days ago. Hi! Okay, so we're back here with Jessica, one of the cardiac surgery physician assistants in our floor. So, what is cabbage? So, cabbage is one of the most common procedures that we do here at this hospital. So, basically, a cabbage is used when people have multiple blockages in their heart, and stents aren't really the best option for that for long term survival. So instead of going through the blockages, we go around them like a detour on the highway. It's an open heart surgery, and that's what we do for patients to prolong their life, prevent them from having any chest pain or shortness of breath, 
and have them live longer than they otherwise would. And that's kind of the purpose of it, and people do very well. Heart surgery isn't the nightmare that it used to be. It's really not that bad, and you know, our patients do very well. Hi to my pimple. <laughs> so just like Jessica said, the main indication for cabbage is really narrowed or blocked arteries in the heart. And this is coined under a collective term called coronary artery disease, which is mainly caused by atherosclerosis or the buildup of plaques made by cholesterol. And these plaques are usually built up over time by... Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> So how do we find out if a patient actually has these arterial blockages and stenosis? Through a procedure called heart catheterization, a thin hollow tube called a catheter is threaded into the vessels of the heart. Contrast dye is injected for visualization. What you're seeing right now is actually my patient's catheterization results. If feasible, as Jessica mentioned, this can be extended into an interventional step called percutaneous coronary intervention, where a stent, a metal or plastic tubular support, is placed to help open up the vasculature. Hi everyone, I'm here with Lisa, one of the physician assistants from Hello. Cardiac Surgery. What are the biggest considerations for the care of post-open heart patients? So I think one of the biggest considerations is getting them up and moving early on in the post-op period. That first day, we want to get them up, sitting in a chair to eat all their meals. And it's very, very important that they're using their incentive spirometer. That's a little thing that we call a lung machine that's basically helping their lungs open up to prevent pneumonia. So those things we really try to drill into our patients early on. And I think those patients have the best outcomes if they do those things. Yeah, so someone with post-open heart, they have a big incision in their chest. What do you think of infections related to that? The patients that we worry the most about are our diabetics with uncontrolled sugars. So we make sure that we get on those patients early on. We have endocrine see them, make sure that their sugars are well controlled. Give them strict activity instructions when they go home to prevent those muscles on the large wound from pulling and opening it up possibly. Yay, hey, thank you so much. You're welcome. Our second patient is a 45-year-old male with atrial fibrillation caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is a tachyarrhythmia, an irregular and rapid heart rate above 100 beats per minute. Hi guys, I'm here with Angie. Hi. She's our, one of our NPs for telemetry, but she was a nurse here on the floor for 10 years prior. So we have a master here. Um, so our question for tonight is, what are the biggest risks if a patient has AFib? One of the biggest risks is stroke. So we want to give them anticoagulation and rate control. With AFib, you have your atria, it's quivering like this. And the valves, the way the valves open and close, you may have little clots that will go up and can go to your brain and you can have a stroke. Thank you so much. So we'll make sure to prevent them with our anticoagulants, That's right? That's right. Thank you. Bye. As Angie mentioned, heart rate control is the goal. We do so via antiarrhythmics like amiodarone, beta blockers like metoprolol, and digoxin. Our last patient is a 39-year-old with congestive heart failure that resulted in the complication of acute kidney injury. CHF is a condition where the heart can't pump enough blood to meet the body's needs. Because there is more blood staying in the heart than leaving after each contraction, this results in fluid backflow and overload, which leads to body swelling, fluid in the lungs, and even inability of blood to reach other systems in the body. Hi guys, I'm here with Natasha and Jamika. We're NPs from the Tele team. What's the biggest considerations for patients who have CHF? Fluid volume status. Absolutely. Your eyes and nose are super important. Intake to output. If they are intaking an incredible amount of fluids and not a lot is coming out, that's a problem. They're fluid overloaded. And we don't want that because if they can't breathe, and they get edematous and uncomfortable, so ins and outs. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and to get rid of that fluid overload all over the body, we have a gold standard, Lasix. Welcome to the waterworks. Most medications are scheduled for 10 p.m. So it's time to take vital signs, pass out meds, and try to caress our patients to sleep. I'm here with Sendri and Hi. Carla. I have a very pressing question for our oh, floor. Geez. Okay. How are our cardiac fellows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is um, um, is it not safe for work? 
We'll just go with very knowledgeable. Yes. Uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, every nurse's favorite part of the shift. Charting. Care plans and notes. Do you sense the joy in my voice? Yep. <laughs> Hi. Hi, baby. I'm gonna say anything. This is the amazing Mirtha. You're handsome. Oh. And I love you. I love you too. I'm handsome? Yes, you are. I paid her one dollar to say that. You are cute. Oh. I like that. I like the sound of that. You are cute. Oh, I forgot sexy too. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you? What did I tell you? It is already 11.30 p.m. So since I got to the unit, I haven't gone to the bathroom, I haven't peed, I haven't drank anything, I haven't really sat down. It's been a busy night and it's usually like this. But you're so lucky. You are so lucky I'm talking to you right now. Well, it's just a quick check-in and... Uh, back out. Hi guys, I'm here with Miss Chantel and Miss Jawali. So Miss Chantel has been here for 37 years oh and Miss Jawali has been here for 22 years. So what do you think is the secret to nursing? You just have to like it and make sure that you come with good disposition, do the work that you have to do, take care for your patient to the best of your ability. Yeah, whatever problems you have, you leave it at the door. And just smile and nod. You have to just internalize a lot less. When you go through the door, then you exhale. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, time to get some break on. I'm gonna take a quick nap. I'll talk to you guys later. I'll explain things later. I guess right now. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Also, before I sleep, let me just say to all those who says that nurses don't do anything, any of those sort of rubbish talk, you have no idea. It's, it's not easy to be a nurse. It's really not. It's, it's not easy. 3 a.m. witching hour views. Nope, that's not cranberry juice. That is bloody urine. I am with J Rod here. Recently engaged. Happy. Must be nice. How does it feel? Feels good. <laughs> Often, intravenous antibiotics are scheduled between 1 to 4 a.m. for patients post procedure for infection prophylaxis or those with existing infections like pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the heart sac. But as time nears 5 a.m., it is time for blood works. For open heart patients, labs are usually requested before 5 a.m. So if any electrolyte levels need to be fixed, it can be done so before change of shift. Each morning, we also change the chest and graft side dressings of post open heart patients using betadine, a topical antiseptic, and regular gauze dressing taped afterwards. We hope to prevent any nocosomial infections during their stay. What do you love most about cardiology? Cardiology, I would say, a very challenging one, but I love it because you know, part of those people or staff that helping these people to recover this one of the leading cause of death in the United States. That's right. According to the CDC in 2018, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States, with a data of 655,381 people. Anyways, it's almost change of shift, but we for sure are still not done or free. There's still a ton to do. It's <sighs> 7.20, shift is done, finally. I am so tired, so sleepy. I need... I need Jesus. <laughs> And this is what an ideal night in the life of a cardiac nurse looks like. Happy, structured, mind stimulating, and fascinating. But those are just the cream and soft marshmallows to this rocky road ice cream life of nursing that I am able to capture with the lens of my camera. But the rock hard almonds, the clips of frustration, fear, exhaustion, misunderstandings, and even the painful moments of death and misery. No photo or video can ever capture the true depth of those moments. There were days where sometimes I just wanted to quit and give up. There were nights where I doubted every bit of myself. 
But it was the excitement. The hugs. The genuineness. The joy. The jokes. The love. The laughter. The passion. And the newfound friends and family outside of home that define nursing for me.